Hello boys and girls, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. I do hope you're well. Uh, today we're taking a little bit of a look at how you can steer a chord sequence, how you can make it go in the direction you want it to go, how to give a chord sequence a sense of momentum basically and make it interesting to the listener. Okay, that little chord progression that you've just heard me play uses one or two little tricks to kind of give it the sense of direction and momentum that I mentioned in the intro. Uh, the first of those that we're going to look at is the use of what are called secondary dominant chords. Okay, let's begin by looking at this E7 chord. <laughs> And let's follow that E7 chord with A minor. And that sounds quite pleasing, very pleasing in fact. But it does present something of a theory problem. And that problem is that nowhere in the A minor universe will you find an E7 chord, or even just a plain old E chord. Now you might remember from the previous video on songwriting tips that the universe of a chord, in this case the A minor universe, is simply the name I give to all of the chords which will occur in the same keys as an A minor chord. A minor occurs in a bunch of different keys and if we look at the collective number of chords in all of those keys they are all related to A minor and I call them the A minor universe and you can see them here. Now even though the E7 doesn't occur in the A minor universe we can still use E7 or just an E chord for that matter in an A minor context. That's because we can use it as something called a secondary dominant chord and those are oh, what I'm going to explain all about now. Put simply, it's all to do with moving four notes up a scale. And if we travel clockwise round this circle, you kind of get the idea. Because the fourth note of a C scale is an F note. The fourth note up a scale of F is a B flat note. The fourth note up a B flat scale is an E flat note, and so on. Now, for reasons which are frankly immensely complicated and beyond the scope of a brief lesson like this, it sounds pleasing to the ear to move chords clockwise around this cycle. Artists as diverse as Irving Berlin, ABBA and even bands like Metallica have made good use of the properties of the cycle of fourths in order to propel a chord sequence. And one of the useful little things that it allows you to do is to land on any chord you want, regardless of whether that chord happens to be in the universe of chords that you're currently inhabiting. For example, you can use a C7 to go to an F minor. F7 takes us to B flat minor. B 
B flat 7 leads to E flat minor and E flat 7 will take us to A flat minor G sharp 7 goes to C sharp minor C sharp 7 will take us to F sharp minor F sharp 7 will lead us to a B minor B7 will take us nicely to E minor E7 will take us to A minor and A7 will land us nicely on D minor the D7 will take us very nicely to G minor and G7 will land us back on the C minor Now, because 7th chords are sometimes known as dominant chords, when you add in a dominant chord from outside the scope of the key or the chord universe that you're inhabiting at the time, you would call it a secondary dominant chord. So you see, the title really does make sense when you know a little bit about it. Secondary dominant chords are a great way of digging yourself out of a hole as a songwriter. If you need to make a verse link to a chorus, or if you need to make a chord sequence link back to itself, the, the end of the sequence going back to the beginning, and you just can't seem to make it fit, if you've painted yourself into a bit of a corner, then use a secondary dominant chord based upon this cycle of fourths, and it will always get you out of trouble. Okay then, so that's secondary dominant chords, that's what they are, how they work and how to use them. There are other types of chords that you can use to kind of steer the sequence in the direction that you want it to go. And I tend to refer to these as signpost chords. And the first type of signpost chord that we're going to look at is the augmented chord. So here's a little bit of info about those. Okay, here are the chords of A minor and E. Now you could do this with an E7 chord, but it's a little bit easier to play with an E chord, and frankly it sounds just as good. What we're going to do is we're going to take the C note from the A minor chord, and we're going to use that to replace the B note in the E chord. And if we do that, we get an E chord where the B notes have been replaced by C notes. Or to put it another way, we have a C augmented chord. Now the chord of C augmented is a lovely little chord for changing in and out of A minor. As you can hear now, here's the A minor chord. And here's the C augmented. And now here they are both together. And as you can see, we can get rid of the open E strings on this chord shape because the E note is kind of already there in the middle, which makes it a movable chord shape that you can take up and down the neck and transpose into other keys as required. But the augmented chord has another little trick up its sleeve. It is what we call symmetrical, which means that it can be moved up and down the neck and stay the same chord. I'll spare you the technical details for now, but basically what it amounts to is you can move this chord shape up or down the neck in four fret stages, and it stays the same chord. For instance, this C augmented, which is at the third fret, can be moved up to the seventh fret, and it will still be a C augmented. And then you can move it up to the eleventh fret, and it will still be a C augmented. This is because we get the same three notes each time, C, E and G sharp, or E, G sharp and C, or G sharp, C and E. Whichever way you add it up, it's the same three notes and therefore the same chord.
And you can also call it by any of those names. You can call a C augmented a G sharp augmented. You can call a G sharp augmented an E augmented, and you can call a E augmented a C augmented. They're all interchangeable. And what usually defines whether it's a E augmented, C augmented, or G sharp augmented is what the bass player is doing underneath. Here's what it sounds like as I move this one chord shape up from the 3rd fret to the 7th to the 11th and back down again and finally I'll resolve it to an A minor. Isn't that a pretty sound? All from just swapping out one of the notes from our original secondary dominant E chord that we began with. It's also worth mentioning that this doesn't just work with minor chords. You can just as easily use a G sharp augmented to take you to an A major chord as well as an A minor. Here's what that would sound like. Okay, don't worry if some of this has flown by a little bit too fast for you to digest properly. All you've got to take away from this is the bottom line, that you can approach any chord, major or minor, via an augmented chord, one semitone below. And that augmented chords will repeat themselves every four frets. Right, so that's augmented chords, what they are and how they work. But there is another type of signpost chord that we can use, and that is the diminished seventh. They have quite a few um, similarities to the augmented chord, but they are kind of different in a couple of important ways. Let's take a look at what's going on with diminished seventh chords then. Okay, here's our E7 chord again, and in much the same way as we did when we looked at augmented chords, we're going to borrow some notes to add into it. This time we're going to borrow notes, or A note, I should say, from the D minor chord. Namely, what we're going to do is take the F note from the D minor chord and replace the E note in the E7 chord with that F note. And if you look at this diagram, it gives us a shape which is pretty much impossible to play. So we're going to have to rearrange these notes somewhat. And the first thing we do is lose the B note on the open second string. We don't need it, the B is already there on the fifth string if you look. Next thing we do is move the D note from the open fourth string to the second string at the third fret. And while we're doing that, we'll replace the uh, D open string with an F note at the third fret, as you can see there. That then gives us a chord known as F diminished seventh. And there's the diagram for it. And there are the fingers that you would use to play it. Now, F diminished seventh is a brilliant chord for leading us into an A minor. And to prove that, here it is. And in much the same way that augmented chords repeat themselves as they move up the neck, so do these diminished seventh chords. The only difference here is that diminished seventh chords move in three fret stages. So you can take this F diminished seventh from the first fret, move it up three frets to the fourth fret, and it's still an F diminished seventh chord. Move it up another three frets to the seventh fret, and it's still an F diminished seventh chord. Move it up to the 10th fret, another 3 frets, and it is still an F diminished 7th chord. And here are all of those different inversions of that chord, all resolving to the A minor chord, as you heard earlier. And just like with augmented chords, the name that you give to these diminished seventh chords isn't that important. You can call it an F diminished seventh, you can call it a G sharp diminished seventh, you can call it a B diminished seventh, or you can call it a D diminished seventh. They're all the same chord because they all contain the same notes. And in the same way as you can use an augmented chord to take you either to a minor chord or a major chord, you can do exactly the same thing with a diminished seventh chord. 
F diminished seventh or G sharp diminished seventh or B or D diminished seventh, call it what you will, will land equally happily on an A minor or an A major chord. And to prove it, here's a demonstration. <laughs> So there you have it, another handy little way of steering a chord sequence in the direction you want it to go. And once again the bottom line is that you can approach any chord, major or minor, from one fret below by using a diminished seventh chord. And any diminished seventh chord shape will repeat every three frets up and down the neck on the guitar. So there you have it, um, secondary dominant chords and augmented and diminished seventh signpost chords as I refer to them. Uh, let's take a look at how all of this is beginning to uh, fit into the chord sequence that we heard at the beginning of the video, shall we? Okay, here's that chord sequence from the top of the video and you can probably see that many of these chords come directly from the A minor universe. and. That leaves a few unaccounted for, but we can deal with those. Uh, let's start with these E7 chords. Well, uh, if you were paying attention when I was talking about secondary dominant chords, you'll realise that that's exactly what they are. E7 is a secondary dominant chord which is pointing at the A minor chord, if you like. What about the G sharp augmented and E diminished 7th chords? Well, they are signpost chords. Uh, signpost chords are the ones that I was referring to earlier, uh, chords which are a semitone below the target chord if you like. Um, you can either place these directly before or directly after the chord in question. So you'll notice that the G sharp augmented comes directly after the target chord of A minor and the E diminished 7 comes directly before the target chord of F major. And that still leaves one chord unaccounted for, the B minor 7 flat 5. So what's going on there then? Well, first of all, don't be scared by chords with long sounding names. Ask any beginner guitarist and they'll tell you the most difficult chord they have encountered is an F chord, a chord with one syllable in its name. So, you know, there's no correlation there between how complicated the name of a chord is and how difficult it is to play. And there's nothing to be scared of here. Basically, all we're doing is doing that technique once again of borrowing a note from another chord. Uh, we're taking the D minor, which is from the A minor universe, and the B minor, which is also from the A minor universe, and we're borrowing the B root note from the B minor chord and using it as the bass note for the D minor. Basically, B minor 7 flat 5 is nothing more than a D minor with a B bass note, or D minor slash B, as it is written in a chord sequence. Essentially, if you're in a band, all you have to do is play a D minor chord and let your bass player worry about the B bass note and you get a B minor 7 flat 5 chord. It is as easy as that. So really speaking, you can see that the B minor 7 flat 5 chord is in effect part of the A minor universe. And if you look at the little sequence that that B minor 7 flat 5 chord is part of, where it's going from a B minor 7 flat 5 to an E7 chord and back to the A minor chord. You will see, if you look at the cycle of fourths, remember that from the secondary dominant stuff, that we're basically moving clockwise around that cycle. And if you remember, I said that for reasons that are a bit complicated, and we're not going to go into them here, Chord sequences that move clockwise around that cycle do sound pleasing to the ear, and that's exactly what this is doing. So there you have it, a chord sequence which may at first glance appear a little bit intimidating. Hopefully you can now see that with a few relatively simple techniques, it's not that scary at all to be honest. And there is one final tool in the toolbox that I want to share with you. Something that can really enhance the sense of direction of a chord sequence, and that is choosing your bass notes wisely. Quite often you assume that the 
lowest note in the chord, the bass note for that chord, is going to be the root note of that chord, the C note under a C chord, a G note under a G chord, and so on. But quite often you can create a more linear flow between the chords by choosing another note in those chords, or from each chord rather. As an example, we're going to look at the verse section, as I call it, from the uh, little chord sequence we've been looking at in this example. Um, if we just take the first few chords of that, we've got an A minor chord, going to a G sharp augmented, going to a C chord, going to a D chord, going to an F chord, going to a C chord, and it goes on from there. Now, that A minor chord obviously has an A note in it. The G sharp augmented chord obviously has a G sharp note in it. The C chord has a G note in it. The D chord will have an F sharp note in it, and obviously the F chord has an F note in it. So I can create a bass line which goes from the A in the A minor chord to the G sharp in the G sharp augmented to the G in the C chord to the F sharp in the D chord to the F in the F chord and so on. And you can make a, a, a kind of a linear flow between the chords in this way. Here's what that sounds like. Here's that chord sequence just played with the root notes um, underneath each chord as, as the bass notes. And then you'll hear the same thing again, but this time with those alternative bass notes in place. This technique of using a bass line which ascends or it usually descends, that tends to be the favourite method of doing it, uh, a descending bass line um, taking notes other than the root out of each chord is a method that has been employed in many, many songs. Everything from something like No Woman No Cry through to Stairway to Heaven through to White a Shade of Pale, the list goes on and on. And if we put all of that together, the A minor chord universe, the secondary dominant chords, the signpost chords, those augmented and diminished sevenths, and then finally the uh, bass line steering the chord sequence in the direction we want it to go, you end up with something that sounds like this. And there it is. I hope you'll agree that that's quite an effective combination of techniques for giving a chord sequence a sense of direction and momentum and basically leading the listener through it. 
You may also have noticed that the sort of crunchy power cord part that was on there um, contained a few sort of riffy bits. Um, what was happening there was that some of the more harmonically complex chords like the diminished sevenths and the minor seven flat five and the augmented chord and so on, um, they don't sound too good if you play them as power chords. Well, you can't play them as power chords. Um, an augmented chord, for instance, and a diminished seventh don't contain the correct notes to turn them into power chords. So what I was doing was turning those chords into riffs simply by spelling the notes of the chord out one at a time. Like the augmented chord, the G sharp augmented, has a G sharp uh, C and an E in it. So I simply played a G sharp note, an E note, and a C note. So like that and you get a nice little riff that sits in there and just gives the whole thing a little bit of shape and that is how I give chord sequences a little bit of momentum and a sense of direction I hope you found it useful I hope you found it even maybe a little bit inspiring and maybe it's uh, spurred you on to go away and try some of these techniques when writing your own songs. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button and that way you will get to see more of them. And if you live on Teesside in the northeast of England, then why not give me a shout for some tailored one-to-one -one guitar tuition. And your first lesson is free, by the way. You'll find the details of how to get in touch at the end of this video. And just quickly before I go, I'm going to give a quick plug to my new album called The Whiskey Made Me Do It, which is available on iTunes iTunes, Deezer, Spotify, Amazon, Google Play, all the usual places basically and it is absolutely chock full of catchy instrumental guitar based rock so what's not to like there. Okay folks that's it for now see you all next time bye for now.